Good morning. Uh, the Interior Subcommittee is going to conclude two weeks uh, series of budget hearings that have so far covered the Interior Department, including three of its bureaus, the EPA and the Forest Service. And this morning we'll hear from more Interior Bureaus, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Testifying on behalf of the Bureau of Land Management today is uh, uh, Dr. Brian Steed. Dr. Steed has served as the Bureau's Deputy uh, Director for Policy and Programs since 2017 and is currently exercising the authority of the Director. And BLM is responsible for manage mo managing more than 245 million acres of federal land, primarily in the West, and it has a multi-purpose mission, and it's not always easy to balance that mission, as members of this subcommittee Committee know very well, and so do you, Mr. Steed. Well, Ms. This McClellan, yes. You may not know this, but Dr. Steed was my former chief. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> what a claim to fame! <laughs> <laughs> the other claim to fame is he's good friends with my chief of staff. <laughs> <laughs> so I and we both appreciate the delicate balance he has to do, yeah. keeping you happy <laughs> <laughs> and me happy, everybody happy. Um, but despite uh, all that uh, Dr. C is faced with, the President's budget request for BLM is a cut of 12% from the current enacted levels, including $126 million from basic day-to-day -day operations. So that means uh, fewer resources to manage wildland habitat, ensure safe and accessible recreation opportunities, and support the sustainable management of our public lands. One area in BLM's budget that is uh, spared to cut, though, is the ener energy and minerals activity, which gets a slight bump to pursue onshore drilling, including the Arctic Wildlife, Ma uh, Wildlife Refuge. But as many of you won't be surprised, I'm disappointed uh, to see that uh, President Trump is using his proposed budget once again to show uh, his favoritism towards oil and gas corporations. Um, uh, representing the Bureau of Ocean and Management is Dr. Walter Cruikshank, uh, the Deputy Director, who is currently the Acting Director. Dr. Cruikshank has served as Deputy uh, Director since uh, 2002, all the way back to the former Minerals Management Service. Uh, BOMA, as the Bureau is known, is responsible for all the oil and gas leasing activities on the Outer uh, Continental Shelf and is currently manage manages more than 2,600 oil and gas leases spread over 14 million acres offshore. Unlike the rest of the Interior Department, BOMA has dodged the sequestration bullet and has not had its budget cut. On the contrary, the cr uh, request for the Bureau is up, up by 8 percent. Joining us today to talk about the Bureau of Safety and uh, Environmental Enforcement, or uh, Bessie as it's called, is uh, Mr. Scott Angeli. Is it, am I close? Angel. Angel. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like that even better when you say it. <laughs> uh, uh, he is a former director, uh, a former elected uh, commissioner of the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Bessie, see safety in, uh, inspectors are really important. They fly out to the drilling platforms to inspect the rigs. They have a dangerous and they have a tough job, uh, but they're central to making sure oil and gas operations are conducted in a safe manner. So we appreciate the work that all the federal employees do, but we know they put their life on the line every time they go out on a rig. It's going to be very interesting to hear more from you about the risk-based uh, inspection uh, program that's being implemented. So I welcome each of you to testify this morning. Um, Mr. Joyce is going to put his uh, welcoming statement in the record. Uh, Mr. Stewart, is there anything you wanted to say? No, ma'am, I would just say we, uh, once again, we thank you for, uh, for holding the hearings and to the witnesses. We're grateful for your service and for being here. Great. So um, we're going to use a timer this morning to kind of keep things at at at, uh, at five minutes. Um, I'll it'll blink yellow, um, and when you are at five, I'll lightly uh, tap the gavel. But this morning's going to be very exciting because at some point we're going to have votes. So we're going to try to get through the testimony and questions the very best that we can. So. Please do not be annoyed if you see the chair looking at this. There's a thing on it called Dome Watch, and we can see how much time's left in the vote and how many people have voted. So if that comes out after you hear the bells, 
on making sure we have an opportunity for you all to be heard. So your statements will fully be entered into the record. And so with that, um, we would um, like to uh, uh, turn it over and we'll start with Mr. Steve, Dr. Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the President's fiscal year 2020 budget request for the Bureau of Land Management. On a note of uh, personal privilege, it's really nice to be back in the committee room. Uh, and I'm very happy with the redecorations where we've got the BLM recommended and at least two posters. Uh, the BLM manages approximately 245 million acres of surface land and over 700 million acres of subsurface mineral estate. BLM lands are some of North America's most wild, historic, and scenic landscapes and possess significant energy and mineral resources. These federal lands support production of goods and services that create jobs and promote economic development across the nation. The 2020 uh, BLM budget request is $1.2 billion, including $1.08 billion for the management of lands and resources appropriation and $107 million for the Oregon and California grants, uh, grant lands appropriation. The FY 2020 budget supports opportunities for conservation, outdoor recreation, sustainable timber harvesting, and responsible energy and mineral development. Public lands offer many uh, recreational opportunities, including hunting, fishing, camping, and other outdoor activities. In 2018, BLM managed lands uh, hosted over 67.9 uh, million visitors, a number that's expected to grow over 70 million in uh, 2020. The budget request promotes a balanced approach to managing our recreational lands and cultural resources. The budget proposes 54.8 million for recreation and resources management and 37.1 million for the National Monuments and National Conservation uh, Areas Program. With this money, the BLM uh, will continue to manage and support visitation to designated historic landmarks, prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic and scientific interest on public lands. In addition, the Cultural Resources Management Program, which supports the inventory, protection, and stabilization of BLM cultural resources, will receive $15.6 million in FY2020. As this committee is uh, well aware, last year was one of the nation's most devastating wildland fire seasons. As such, the budget supports the administration's priority for promoting active management of the nation's forests and rangelands to reduce wildfire risk. The BLM budget invests $10.2 million for forest management on public domain lands. Uh, and also requests $107 million in the Oregon and California grant lands appropriation. This will lay the groundwork for an increase in the amount of timber offered for sale to 280 million board feet in the ONC lands by 2021, reflecting the BLM's commitment to advance timber production uh, and forest health. Along with these investments, the administration proposes a package of forest management legislative reforms, which include categorical exclusions for fuels management work. These authorities will improve the ability to treat additional acres more efficiently and effectively thereby reducing catastrophic fire risk and progressing towards more resilient landscapes and fire adapted communities. The budget uh, supports uh, an all of the above energy plan that includes oil and gas, coal, strategic minerals and renewable sources such as wind, geothermal and solar, all of which are developed on public lands. The BLM requests a total of 198.4 million of its energy and minerals a management portfolio to maintain the administration's commitment to American energy independence, generate revenue, and create jobs that grow local economies. Building on FY 2018 and 2019 efforts, the BLM will enhance efficiencies, reduce planning times, and clarify processes, and leverage technology to reduce permitting times. Balancing responsible development of public land uh, resources and habitat conservation ensures the best outcome for the people and the wildlife that rely on these lands. The BLM budget requests uh, build on uh, results for ongoing efforts, including implementing outcome-based grazing and recent sage-grouse management plan amendments, which better align federal habitat conservation efforts with state wildlife management plans. The budget, requests all, or the budget request also seeks to improve habitat and big game migration corridors. Finally, the budget request includes funding to continue identifying innovative ways to address the growing impact that an increasing number, uh, or increasing number of wild horses and burrows uh, put on ecosystems and on, on the taxpayer resources. The BLM takes pride in, this, uh, in its collaborative efforts to increase access and to enhance outdoor recreation opportunities, maintain productive working landscapes for grazing and timber, and promote responsible energy production. The President's FY 2020 budget request for the BLM provides the necessary tools for the Bureau to continue to provide sustainable benefits for the nation. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present testimony today, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions you have. Thank you.
Good morning, Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the fiscal year 2020 budget request for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. The administration's offshore energy strategy calls for boosting domestic energy production to stimulate the nation's economy and promote national security while providing for responsible stewardship of the environment. These goals align with BOEM's mission to manage the development of our nation's offshore energy and mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible manner. BOEM accomplishes this mission through its oil and gas, renewable energy, and marine minerals programs, all of which are guided by rigorous science-based environmental review and analysis. The 2020 request proposes $193.4 million for BOEM operations, of which $56.5 million is offsetting collections. The request includes a net increase of BOEM's total budget authority of $14.2 million over the 2019 enacted level and reflects a careful analysis of the resources needed to develop the Bureau's capacity to execute its mission carefully, responsibly, and efficiently. It includes increases that will support implementing the new National OCS Oil and Gas Leasing Program, advance renewable energy activities, and initiate an OCS critical minerals inventory. BOEM's conventional energy budget supports a broad range of responsibilities related to offshore oil and gas activities. In 2018, offshore federal production reached approximately 644 million barrels, a record high, and almost one trillion cubic feet of, of natural gas. This production generates billions of dollars in revenue every year for the U.S. Treasury, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Historic Preservation Fund, and state and local governments, while supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs. For its, congressional, uh, for its conventional energy activity, BOEM requests increases to support the new national OCS program, which we expect to be implementing during 2020. The requested increases support additional tools and resources to ensure receipt of fair market value, manage lease sales and data, and coordinate leasing activities, including extensive outreach with stakeholders. I note that the proposed program has not been finalized, and this request is not intended to presume any particular secretarial decision on the contents of the new national OCS program. In recognition of the role renewable energy can play in securing the nation's energy independence and supporting economic growth, the 2020 request supports BOEM's growing renewable energy program and includes an increase of $500,000 to hold two energy lease sales in 2020. BOEM oversees 15 active commercial wind energy leases offshore the Atlantic coast that have fully developed with power over 6.5 million homes. In support of the renewable energy goals of coastal states along both the Atlantic and Pacific coast, funding proposed in fiscal year 2020 enables BOEM to expand its renewable energy leasing activity through extensive planning and analysis and robust outreach efforts. BOEM is also the steward of OCS mineral resources. The 2020 request emphasizes the importance of BOEM's work in this area by proposing a new marine minerals budget activity. BOEM oversees OCS sand and gravel used in support of coastal resilience projects, including hurricane recovery, beach nourishment, and coastal restoration activities, which have resulted in the restoration of hundreds of miles of coastline, protection of coastal infrastructure, and protection and restoration of important ecological habitat. While the Bureau's marine mineral work so far has been along the Atlantic coast and in the Gulf of Mexico, Interest in OCS sand and gravel resources in other areas has been growing. The 2020 request proposes funding to initiate a marine mineral project offshore Alaska's North Slope to inventory sand and gravel resources to support infrastructure projects. Because resources in this particular area may also include critical minerals important to U.S. manufacturing and technology, BOEM will leverage this funding to support assessments of both sand and critical minerals. As stated in the America First Energy Plan, the need for energy must go hand in hand with environmental stewardship. BOEM is responsible for assessing the impacts of and providing effective environmental safeguards for OCS energy and mineral resource exploration and development. BOEM develops, funds, and manages scientific research to inform these assessments and provide the foundation for sound science-based policy decisions. The 2020 request provides significant increases specifically for implementa implementation of the new national OCS program. Environmental studies are necessary to address data gaps and information within areas that might be included in the next national OCS program. These resources will also support NEPA analyses, stakeholder engagement, consultations, and Coastal Zone Management Act coordination. In this time of serious fiscal constraints, we appreciate the resources the subcommittee has provided BOEM for this fiscal year. Our 2020 request builds on this investment and reflects a careful analysis of the resources needed for the Bureau to carry out the important mission with which we are charged. Thank you once again for this opportunity to testify and for your consistent support for BOEM's programs. And I look forward to our continued work together and to answering your questions. Thank you. The microphone, when you're ready. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Cullum and uh, Ranking Member Joyce, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here this morning to discuss the fiscal year 2020 budget request for the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, also known as BESI. My name is Scott Angel. I'm the fourth director of BESI since its creation in 2011. I have served as BESI's director since May of 2017 after devoting much of my career to natural resource issues in my home state of Louisiana. As many of you are aware, BESI is the lead federal agency charged with improving safety and ensuring environmental protection related to the energy industry operating on the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf. The Bureau vigorously regulates oversight of worker safety, emergency preparedness, environmental compliance, and the safe and environmentally sustainable development of the nation's offshore energy resources. The FY 2020 budget request for BESI is $200.5 million, consistent of $120.9 million in appropriated funds and $70.6 million in offsetting collections from rental receipts, cost recoveries, and inspection fees. This is a net $798,000 decrease from FY 2019 CR baseline level. The net decrease is the result of a $3.5 million decrease in current appropriations and a two times since 2013, the ratio of requested appropriated funds, $0.7 million increase in offsetting to requested offsetting collection funds has decreased. The 2020 budget request enables BESI to continue to achieve its mission through a program of appropriate standards and regulations, efficient permitting, robust inspections, effective compliance monitoring and enforcement, rigorous technical assessments, and thorough incident investigations. Critical to achieving this mission is our workforce of engineers, inspectors, geoscientists, analysts, investigators, and other technical and support staff. We have more than 750 personnel located in regional and district offices in Louisiana, Texas, California, Alaska, a technology center in Houston, and an oil spill response research and training facility in coastal New Jersey, and obviously our headquarters here in Washington, D.C. metro area. Key initiatives in recent years have focused on attracting and retaining an experienced, well-trained workforce. This year is no exception. The department's FY 2020 budget request demonstrates a continued commitment to enhancing oversight, regulatory and research capabilities by building and sustaining staff capacity. We will continue to develop and maintain an accountable, competent, and engaged workforce that allows Bessie to successfully evaluate and oversee the very complex energy development activities that occur on the Outer Continental Shelf. To better reflect offshore activity, Bessie is proposing the addition of an inspection fee for non-rig units. This proposal has been included in the preceding three budget years. When Congress first authorized Bessie to collect inspection fees in FY 2020, 2010, most well operation activities were conducted by drilling rigs. As the industry has changed, Bessie has seen the increased use of non-rigs as a lower cost alternative for the work once conducted only by drilling rigs. The operations of these non-rig units have increased from 23 non-rig units in October 2012 to 64 non-rig units in October 2018. This has resulted in a number of non-rig inspections having increased significantly between 2014 and 2018. To better align inspection activity with the collection of facility inspection fees in FY 2020, we are also proposing language to allow for the quarterly billing rather than the annual collection process currently used for facility inspection fees. This will provide a more equitable administration of the Bureau's collection. <coughs> Specifically, the 2020 requ request will support several best priorities. First, risk-based inspections. We're requesting 5.5 million program increase for, so that BESI can further expand this program which supplements current inspections, targeting additional resources on higher risk facilities and higher risk components. This approach gives BESI another tool in the toolbox so we can ensure companies are adequately assessing risk and continuing, imp continually improving risk management offshore with the goal of preventing incidents from ever happening. Last year, we conducted 82 risk-based inspections. Second, improving inspection and program efficiency we are committed to continually exploring ways to increase the overall efficiency of the program while ensuring the inspection program operates at the highest level of effectiveness. During 2020, Bessie's e-record initiative led to an approximately 6.1% increase in the physical inspection time offshore, resulting in an increase in the number of inspections by 5% over the same period from 2016. Bessie will continue to refine its inspection strategy to better reflect the actual risk and phases of development on the OCS. Third, we plan to continue to work you now enhancing capacity, ensuring accountability, and assessing risk. A significant amount of work has already been done and folded into Bessie's oversight program. Work continues in other important areas, 
for instance, the first OC the SAFE OCS program. This is a program that allows for voluntary reporting of near misses. This administration inherited a program at a 3% participation ratio, and in two years, we've increased that number to 82%. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And as I said earlier, your full um, statement will be put in the record. Um, I am going to turn to my vice chair, Ms. Pingree, for the first question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you all for being here today, and uh, thank you for cheering, sharing your chief of staff with all of us. I'm sure that gave you some great experiences going into this position. Um, we had the Assistant Deputy Secretary here last week, and uh, I let him know that I was not pleased with the administration's um, Outer Continental Shelf proposal. I come from the state of Maine, as most people end up knowing. and. In Maine, of course, as many of you know, um, fishing industry, tourism industry, that is our economy, our outdoor economy. We a, have a $5.6 billion tourism industry, 71% of which happens on the coast. 30,000 Mainers make their living in marine industries, which may not sound like a lot of people from some states, but we only have 1.3 million people, and uh, that is uh, a huge focus of our state, as well as our $500 million annual lobster fishery, which is an important part of our economy, but really our culture and our tourism industry. For my constituents, they are very clear. They do not want expanded uh, offshore fossil fuel development. They believe it will negatively impact our coast. It will take a risk um, with our fishing and our tourism industry. Um, and we're just 100 percent clear about that. Um, but today I have some concerns about the proposed cut to research on responding to oil spills that would likely result from any offshore drilling operations. Um, the administration's FY 2020 budget would cut oil spill research um, from a 14.899 million level of the level that was provided by Congress in 18 and 19 to 12.7. So that's a reduction in about 15 percent. We need to be prepared for oil spills wherever they take place. Um, indeed, your own statistics show that there are hundreds of oil and chemical spills from offshore drilling operations every year. Bessie, which I greatly appreciate that you have that written out there so I know exactly what you're uh, called. Um, and the chair has admonished us not to use acronyms, so um, it's the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement has reported that there are s at least 6,500 oil spills occurred in federal waters between 27 and 2017. So to me, um, cutting this research seems counterproductive and begs the question why. Why is the administration proposing to cut funding for oil spill research while at the same time developing a plan to greatly expand offshore oil and gas leasing? Thank you. Uh, so this is again for the record, Scott Ongeal. Again, although the 2020 request provides for approximately about 2.2 million, as you said, reduction in oil spill research, uh, we are confident the research will n the reduction will not hamper the effectiveness of the oil spill preparedness program. Through a critical analysis of spending intended to focus resources on the most important needs, the funding will be, we believe, sufficient for BESI to maintain a robust, world-class program grounded in applied and developmental research, regulatory oversight, close integration between BESI, industry, and our other governmental agencies. The FY 2020 budget readily supports, we believe, all these responsibilities to ensure that offshore facility owners and operators are prepared to respond to a spill. The budget also fully supports the operations and maintenance of the National Oil Spill Response Research and Renewable Test Facility, otherwise known as OMSET in New Jersey. And I appreciate that you have an answer for me, but I, I guess I will continue to voice those concerns, and particularly if there is a significant expansion in oil drilling at all. Um, so we'll just follow what we're doing, what you're doing, but I, I do believe that um, researching this and continuing to invest in that is, is critically important. And I just want to talk about one other area that's not Maine, but where there's a lot of um, concern. I have a lot of people, and a lot of my own constituents write into me, contact my office about drilling in the Arctic and their concerns about the coastal plain. Over 3,100 Mainers have written to me about this topic, even though you couldn't be further from drilling in the Arctic. But we're passionate about our, the Arctic and also the environment. They feel drilling will have a serious environmental impact on, the spot on this, uh, as we all know, biologically rich area, including potentially devastating effects for caribou, polar bears, and birds and the pollution and impacts from oil and gas activities will be felt well beyond any project area. 
with so much at stake, it's disturbing to see that the DOI and BLM seem to uh, pursue a severely seem to be pursuing a severely expedited environmental review without adequate information and that the agencies are not taking the time <coughs> to gather additional scientific information or update stale information. <coughs> Excuse me. I am deeply concerned that your department is taking this course of action in the face of insufficient scientific information and that you will not collect the necessary scientific information to evaluate the impacts. It's my understanding that there are 10 studies that have been listed as a priority for Interior to complete in order to meet the regulatory requirements and to inform the environmental review processes for the oil and gas leasing program and any permitting decisions related to seismic exploration. So can you tell the committee what studies have recently been done to inform the environmental review in the Arctic? Will those be made available during the EIS process to the public? And what is your specific plan, including a timeline for completing the studies that are needed listed in the memo? Ms. Pingree, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, people in Maine are concerned. Um, as this committee is well aware, uh, Congress tasked the BLM in the 2017 tax bill uh, to explore um, uh, drilling uh, in the 1002 area of ANWR. The 1002 area is a uh, 1.5 uh, million acre uh, part of of what is otherwise a 19 million wild, uh, 19 million acre wildlife refuge. Uh, of that, we're exploring a very small portion uh, of of that for oil and gas development. Uh, we are in the beginning processes of of where we are. We've completed a draft environmental impact statement. We're in the process of reviewing the comments that have come in regarding that draft environmental impact statement. Uh, and uh, we'll be reviewing it uh, and then and then uh, going forward with a final. Uh, <coughs> after that point, there'll be an opportunity for protest of that um, environmental impact statement uh, and we'll proceed. As to an expedited timeline, I would, I would disagree with the characterization, uh, although I, I would say that Congress has asked us by a date certain to have uh, two oil and gas uh, lease sales completed. Uh, we intend to, to make that commitment. Uh, and uh, our intent is very much to keep the science at the forefront. We can't, we can't do what we do at the BLM without having uh, the science. And so uh, I can tell you that, uh, that there certainly is robust environmental reviews ongoing and will continue to go on through this process. Well, thank you for your answer. I, of course, opposed the 2017 tax bill and particularly opposed to having this um, uh, you know, push to do the drilling in that tax bill, but I know you're carrying out what you want to do, and I'll be anxious to follow the information ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Joyce, so are you a designee to go uh, next? Yeah, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Chairwoman and, and uh, Mr. Joyce, and again to the to witnesses today, thank you, Dr. Steed. It's always good to see you. Uh, you know, you may not remember this, but the first time we met was uh, when you were flying home back to Salt Lake City after having testified before a panel in Congress, and here you are back again in a s somewhat different position. I love it when we ask you questions and the witnesses say, thank you for that question, when you know they didn't really want to take that question. <laughs> <laughs> but they're so polite. <laughs> I, I, if I can answer it, it's still not as comfortable it's to still testify. Not as comfortable. <laughs> So, uh, but, uh, but, you know, to our chairwoman and I think this committee in general, uh, look, we have deep disagreements uh, between us, but thank you for your, your tone and the example that you set, Ms. McCollum, in, in being able to have a conversation in a thoughtful way and uh, not an adversarial way. And I think you do set a great tone for the committee on that. Because look, these issues are very controversial. They're very emotional for a lot of people. Um, I, I want to mention two things to you, and, and to the other p other panelists, uh, we have the Great Salt Lake in my in my state. It's a s body of salt water. It's not the ocean. We don't do off offshore drilling there. So, uh, your your backgrounds and things you do are not as relevant. So you'll forgive me for for concentrating those that are, and that's the BLM, which owns and controls a significant part of the West, a significant part of my state. Uh, two things, Dr. Steed, that I think are concerned. One of them you mentioned, and you mentioned both of them in your in your testimony and in the written portion. Uh, and one of them uh, is it won't surprise you is wildfires. I'm going to ask both questions quickly and then allow you to respond. Uh, Mike, we spend over a billion dollars on wildfires in the West. Is that true? Do you remember the number? It's more than that. Yeah, it's a boatload of money. Uh, I know that you and I share this concern. Um, and uh, and some of that's on on state land. Some of it's on forest, but a lot of it's on BLM land as well. So talk to us about your plan for fire suppression and fire mitigation, if you could. And the second thing, and I, 
uh, this is important to me because it's it's affected some people in my district and and back home, and that is they don't feel like BLM law enforcement is their friend. They feel like they've been uh, abused in some cases, that they've been heavy-handed and arrogant, and when we talk to our local sheriffs, some of them feel the same way. So I wish you would address what you call here restoring trust and being a good neighbor, and I think it's interesting you have to stay res say restoring trust because the implication there is that we've lost a little bit of trust, and I think that's true. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'll ask you to respond to that, is thank you for your help and the BLM's help on a very, very difficult issue, and that's helping our wild horses in the West. Um, and I think if we, can, if we can solve that problem, and people have worked with us in good faith, and we're very grateful for that, and that is, that is a beautiful thing for those, you know, those great animals. So thank you for your help on that, and then if you would address fire suppression and then restoring trust. Certainly, uh, and I'll start with thank you for the question, <laughs> questions. Um, you know, you happen to hit on two of, uh, of the most important issues that I think that we face as an agency, um, and I'll take those in, in uh, well, wildfire as, as number one, and number two is wild horses, but let me uh, talk about wildfire first. Um, as, as you all noted, um, uh, there was substantial fire activity last year. Um, anecdotally, uh, I would receive an, a daily phone call uh, every day from our fire operation center that would go through what fires we had burning, what anchorage was burning. And some of those fires were truly terrifying. The Mar I'll cite the Martin Fire in uh, northern Nevada that at one point was burning at a rate of about 10 miles an hour. Uh, it ended up burning 550,000 acres of prime sage grouse habitat and other things that we concern, we're concerned about as an agency. Uh, I think that we have an obligation to do better in doing that and being better prepared. Uh, the administration has put a strong emphasis on fire preparedness and in fire readiness. And in so doing, I uh, want to emphasize the ability to go out and, and attack fuel loads um, and other buildup uh, in areas that are of, of well, well overdue for such treatments. Uh, so this budget um, looks to do just that. Uh, one of the things we're doing uh, actively, we have an interesting uh, fire portfolio. While we do have sizable timberlands, the majority of our areas is more, um, is more grasslands or, or um, rangelands. Uh, because of that, uh, those fires burn differently uh, than, uh, than forest fires, and our management techniques are also different. We're doing a, a bunch of remediation activities on that uh, and, and using grazing as one of the tools to beat down some of that fuel load. And I think that you'll be seeing more of that over the next uh, uh, few months, especially as we trend into fire season. Uh, this year is particularly interesting because it's been such a wet year uh, and we will have a lot of green grass that will then eventually turn brown and that's of concern to everyone that's concerned with fine fuels. Uh, as for wild horses, uh, we are committed to having long-term solutions here and are happy to work with this committee to do that. I know that the committee asked for a report, which we are actively working on, uh, to make sure that we're able to um, deal with this horse problem in a humane and a, and a robust way. And I say that because we have um, many times um, the, the, what science would tell us is the appropriate level of horses in many areas. Uh, what to do about those horses is problematic and that some of those horses are in areas where we haven't grazed in decades and they're just eating uh, the ground or they're eating the, the grass down to the ground uh, which e leads to erosion, a bunch of other ecological problems. And uh, so it's kind of wild horses versus the environment and we need to do, to do better and be more aggressive in dealing with that. We have planned a robust gather schedule. Uh, we're committed to not um, using lethal means to deal with these horses, and so we have to find a long-term solution on how to deal with those horses that are in holding. And I look forward to a conversation if you have additional questions on, on what we propose to do there, but it's, it's, it's certainly of issue. Lastly, BLM law enforcement, uh, it's, it, it is, of, of course, very interesting to us. Um, uh, in Utah, there has been uh, a, a lot of um, back and forth, and there, there did develop uh, an unhealthy relationship between um, some federal law enforcement and some state law enforcement. We've worked very hard to re rearrange our relationships. We've, we've gone in and met with local sheriffs and make sure that we can have cooperative agreements uh, and other uh, understandings. I personally attended the Western Sheriffs Association Conference in Reno last month in order to make sure that we're building those relationships, and I think it's important because we, I mean, we manage 245 million acres of, of surface estate, and much of that lies in other jurisdictions, so counties, 
and, and we rely on those county officials on a day-to-day -day basis to help us do our jobs. So we have to have a good relationship there, and so we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Director Cruikshank, I was um, hoping to chat with you about uh, offshore drilling. The um, folks off the coast of Washington State uh, who depend on our waters for, uh, for our fisheries and for tourism um, don't want offshore drilling. Uh, the list of 47 proposed leases, um, lease sales, including seven in the Pacific region, not only uh, ignores some of the realities of climate change, but it ignores the uh, concerns of the coastal communities that I represent. Um, on page 80 of your budget, it says you'll begin drafting four new environmental impact statements for six proposed lease sales planned for 2020 um, uh, when your agency have, hasn't completed the review process yet for the five-year leasing program. So I, I, I guess what I want to get at is moving forward with these six proposed uh, leases now suggests that the final approval of the five-year plan is a foregone conclusion and I fear undermines the integrity of the entire public review process. So can you explain to the committee uh, why you're moving forward with these lease sales when the plan hasn't been approved yet? Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, Representative Comer. First of all, what, what you're reading in the budget document is uh, how we w would intend to spend dollars in 2020 to implement a program that we expect will be more clearly defined during 2020 than it is right now. Uh, we, um, we, we recognize that it's a, it's a challenge to put a budget together when you don't know exactly what a final program will look like. Um, we are working on the proposed program now, uh, and when we have the Secretary's decisions on what will be in that proposal, which will also go out for a public comment period, uh, we, we will be able to, to visit with uh, the, the committee staff and, and, and the committee members is appropriate to talk about how that lines up with, with what, what uh, might be needed in 2020 and should there be substantial change. We, we are not assuming that the full draft proposed program will be what, what we will be implementing in 2020, but we recognize the program will likely be different than the current one that we are under. I know you've gotten 47,000 public comments on the draft proposal. Not a single comment um, uh, supported a lease sale in Washington and in the, or in the Washington and Oregon uh, program area. Um, you did receive hundreds, uh, if not thousands, in opposition, uh, and yet the draft plan includes a planned lease sale in Washington State that's scheduled for 2021. 20, uh, um, is the intent to move forward with that sale? So the. Um we actually received over two million comments on the draft proposed program. Um, we uh, are considering all the comments that are received, uh, th that along with the analyses under OCS Lands Act and National Environmental Policy Act will be presented to the acting secretary so he can make his decisions on what to include in the next proposal. Uh, so um, that will inform what things we need to start working on uh, in the latter part of 19 and into fiscal 2020. And until we have that decision, we, we, we can't say exactly what sales we'll be working on. I asked about some of the concerns that were raised by coastal communities since there, I think there are legitimate concerns about just the incompatibility of offshore drilling with some of the uses, but I, I'd like to focus on one issue and that's the impacts to military readiness. Um, the Northwest Training Range Complex stretches from the waters off of Mendocino County in California all the way up to the Canadian border includes the Keyport Range complex in my district. The training and testing activities that are conducted by the Navy are critical uh, to maintaining and training and equipping our naval forces so that they can protect us, they can protect our national security. Um, uh, the Navy relies on, uh, on that training range because of its unique ac attributes, including um, the significant depths and the lack of um, competing noise signals. So these activities can't be replicated someplace else. Given that uh, considerable national security interest um, of the Navy's activities in the waters off our district and throughout the West Coast, has there been consultation with the Navy to determine how the seven new proposed lease sales for the, si for the Pacific region might negatively impact their operations? There has. We, we have a memorandum of agreement with Department of Defense that dates back to 1983 uh, in which we work very closely with them as we develop any program. Uh, we, we meet with them frequently, get their input on a compatibility assessment. We recognize the importance of their mission. They recognize the importance of ours, and we look for solutions to, to, uh, to see how we can uh, 
allow both missions to move forward without impairing we have no interest in impairing our national defense readiness and we look to the secretary of defense to inform us about what restrictions we need to place on our program to make sure that we are not creating problems for this specific to the pacific region can you provide the committee with written details of when and with whom those consultations occurred as well as any feedback you received from the navy we can do that thank you thanks madam chair i yield back mr tilmer you and i both serve on defense and i would be very um um, honor to join you on a letter asking the same questions to the Department of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy on that. Thank you. Let's hope everything matches. Uh, Mr. Joyce, are you designated? Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Um, first, let me just say thank you, uh, Dr. Steve, for the work you've been doing on sage grass. Uh, I think we're moving forward on that uh, with a plan that will save sage grass. Uh, make sure that they're not listed, and also address the concerns uh, of ranchers and others in the district that put together these collaborative uh, efforts uh, of sage grouse conservation and stuff. Is wildfire the biggest uh, destroyer of habitat of sage grouse? In some areas, yes. <laughs> Is grazing an effective way of reducing the risk of wildfires? Yes. Uh, I've asked uh, Mr. Cameron this question two weeks ago, but perhaps you could shed some light on the status. I've heard some concern from utility companies about con with concerns about the BLM's right-of-way bonding requirements proposed by the last administration. This was proposed through an interim instruction memorandum, whatever the hell that is. Uh, does the BL BLM plan to move forward with this proposal? Uh, sir, we're still evaluating that. The, the issue is as follows. We have... Uh, a lot of land that's spread across the western United States. Right. And much of that, you know, if you go from one community uh, in Idaho to another community in Idaho, you're going to cross very likely some public lands, whether that be BLM or Forest Service. Uh, if it's our land, uh, we have an obligation to maintain, to make sure that that land is kept in, in, in pretty good condition, right? It's undue or unnecessary degradation is our standard that we have to apply. And one of the ways we do that is, is by requiring bonds. And we do that right. for some things, but not other things. And we're trying to figure out what the best way to go about that. So there's no decision that's been made. Uh, if we were to go forward with it, there would be a full rulemaking process. So we'd be able to have um, uh, sufficient public input uh, to understand what the, the equities are uh, and what the interests are. Uh, and, uh, but, but honestly, no decision's been made, and we're still contemplating. Is any idea when that would be moving forward one way or another? I, I assume that we would have a decision within this fiscal year, um, but I'll have to get back to you on okay. that. Okay. Uh, I noticed in your budget that you expanded the legislative ask for the Public Lands Infrastructure Fund to include BLM. Uh, frankly, this is a great idea and a great addition, and something I've author offered in, authored in two bills last Congress, the Land Act and the Restore Our Public Parks Act. Both have received good bipartisan support. Uh, can you expand on the deferred maintenance legislative ask for the BLM and what types of maintenance work this will cover? Sure. Uh, so as a large land management agency, uh, we have infrastructure that uh, is always in need of upkeep and maintenance. Uh, we do have a sizable backlog when it comes to that upkeep and maintenance. And so one of the things that we've asked for within our legislative proposals is to be included in the Public Lands Infrastructure Fund. Uh, which is a, uh, is a proposal, again, uh, to use revenue from uh, generally oil and gas uh, leases uh, in order to uh, then fund infrastructure projects. Um, many of those oil and gas leases anecdotally come off BLM lands, so it only makes sense that BLM could use that money as well right. uh, in, in infrastructure projects. Um, we have a number of needs. Um, I, and I, I will say, just again, anecdotally, I was in a meeting um, a Oh, three weeks ago with a county commissioner from, uh, from California who uh, talked about the needs, the desperate needs for a new uh, pit toilet uh, near uh, their <laughs> outhouses, uh, <laughs> near, uh, near uh, a popular trail in his jurisdiction, uh, and we're looking into that, but it's those types of things all over uh, yeah. the BLM that uh, we could certainly uh, use as much resources as possible. Thank you. Um, thank you. I have questions for all of you gentlemen, but I'm going to um, go 
go back to the BLM here for just uh, my, my first round. Uh, Dr. Seed, on March 1st, I wrote to Secretary Purdue and the Interior Acting Secretary Bernhardt asking for background information on the administration's decision to reinstate the mineral leases for Twin Metals pro uh, Project on the edge of the Boundary Waters Wilderness Canoe Area in Minnesota. In 2016, the Forest Service, building on many years of past research, <coughs> I uh, found that putting a copper, uh, copper sulfite mine on the border of a wilderness, and I, I quote their word, extreme, could cause extreme environmental harm, and extreme was their word. Despite sitting on leases for more than um, you know, a half a century, Twin Metals all of a sudden decided to press their case as soon as there was a new administration with a new solicitor, and BLM has now been told to go back and work on the renewing leases. So on March 1st, I asked to be given the background by April 1st, 30 days, on the Twin Metals lease decisions uh, and the canceling mineral withdrawal on the Rainy River watershed or any other pending or potential mineral actions in the area. I haven't received that yet, so if you could please find out when I could expect to have uh, my, um, my uh, letter answered, that would be fabulous. And if I could hear um, by next week, that would even be better because if I don't hear from me by the end of next week, I'm going to call you. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, you know where to find me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to receive your phone call uh, and I will um, uh, track down where it is. Great. Thanks. So um, um, there's another reform that's being proposed by the administration and that's changing the length of time some of the interior bureaus are given to spend their funding. The basic idea of the appropriation bill is that it covers one fiscal year. Uh, and uh, that's in the case of construction accounts or land acquisition accounts. And there are projects that can be multi-year and we need to be flexible on when spending is warranted. All of those cases in the interior appropriation bills, you know, we, we provide that kind of flexibility. But basic operation accounts, which are nearly all salary and day-to-day -day expenses, tend to be one or two year appropriations. This year, the department has proposed extending the time limit on appropriations for the National Park Service, the solicitor, and the inspector general from one to two years. As we work together, Mr. Joyce and I, to craft our bill, uh, I would like to give that uh, request serious consideration. But we, as stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, we have a real responsibility to ensure that the money that your agency has held in account you know, is, is spent spent accordingly. So I'm curious to know why BLM also didn't propose making its operations accounts two years, like those of the other agencies. BLM's $1 billion uh, um, dollar per year operations account is available indefinitely. And because of that, I believe your agency has a sizable amount of unspent funding, some of it going back several years be before you were there. Just as an aside, I would note having a pot of unspent money, not the collection of user fees, is what has allowed BLM to bring back the oil and gas employees during the recent government shutdown, while the rest of the staff remained furloughed. Given how tight resources are, and they're, res they're, they're tight for all of us in, in this subcommittee and all the subcommittees across, across uh, the appropriations jurisdiction, I think it's sensible for a committee to consider rescinding those funds and putting them back to ongoing projects. I also think the committee should seriously consider regaining control over BLM's budget by shifting it to a shorter time framework on appropriations, particularly for the day-to-day -day operations. So uh, if you can't, I don't, you can get back to me on this, but we are going to be putting our budget and I'd like a response back on a timely matter. So I'm, this is what I'm going to ask you to respond to and we'll do this in writing as well. I would like to know if there's any practical reasons you know that would keep BLM from operating as it does. Uh, if the committee were to convert your appropriation from no year money to the shorter one or two year appropriations money like the rest of the department. So I'm not asking you to do anything that we don't ask others to do. Uh, and could uh, you, do you have in front of you today, I know we were, had a brief discussion uh, earlier, the unobligated balances for the management of lands and resources account? Sure. If nothing more, if you just have a good faith estimate and then you can get us uh, specific details sure. later. Excuse me. 
Thank you so much. We want, that, we want that recorded. How much do you think you have? Uh, uh, 133.8 million in unobligated balances. However, let me explain one thing about that, because I think it's a substantial caveat, that about uh, 73 million of that is uh, from deferred maintenance, monies that were provided in the FY18. Uh, and and it, so it's, it's, an accounting, it's an accounting problem. That, uh, that 73 million, at the very least, all of which has been, has been uh, has been planned for, uh, but the way that we have done that is, is a piecemeal accounting. And so as soon as it's planned for by penny by penny, when the uh, project is ready to go, then that's considered obligated, right? But we're doing that in very small tranches. So it's not as if we don't have intent to, pl to spend the 73 million on, on uh, infrastructure projects and on deferred maintenance. Uh, that being said, with the remainder of the question, I'd be happy to have a further conversation about why flexibility benefits the BLM on funding. And uh, I think it also lends into the, the, the response of why uh, other agencies are seeking more flexibility in their spending. But we're happy to have that conversation. Okay, well, Mr. Joyce, you're the accountant out of the guru here, so <laughs> I'm sure you, you got all those high pollutant account accountancy terms we just heard. And <laughs> you and I can pour over that together when we get it. So um, they have called for votes. We have time to get um, at least one, one more um, uh, question in and then I'm going to confer with staff here about what we do about coming back um, So mr. Joyce your designee mr. Armaday Thank you um, Thank you madam chair Brian good to see you again I know we haven't talked much and and you still have my sympathies for the fact that you are a survivor of working for mr. Stewart who I told I was going to say that to and someday when I get off a of committee restriction I'll be allowed to sit with the rest of the committee for but you know that's a work in progress yeah, there you go. Hey, d d just a couple of quick things. All my stuff is oversight related. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of go down the list knowing that we're gonna, we're gonna do some stuff quicker. Um, I wanna give you a copy of this letter that's about seven months old now that I got from the solicitor of the Department of Interior telling me that in response to a request to the then Secretary of Interior, I'd really like Nevada to have a solicitor stationed in Nevada. I'm not gonna repeat that for the record. You know what I'm talking about. It's it's almost two years in progress. A and so I made the request when there were openings in Sacramento. Nevada is the only western state that doesn't have a solicitor in Nevada. No offense to the wonderful people in, and I know some of them are Department of Interior assets, but I think BLM has the majority of the five lawyers there. And so in an oversight sense, I think I've been patient. It was very nice of that gentleman to tell me he'll consider my stuff in reorganization, but I've had nothing but crickets from that person. And so that's not necessarily a BLM thing, but I still think it's a huge oversight thing to say, why isn't the state with the largest BLM jurisdiction percentage-wise in the nation have a solicitor located within the borders of the state? Um, so if you could have some of those folks uh, um, edify me, here's the reason why I'm upset. And I'm not upset, I'm old now. I was upset when I was young. At the time the request was made, there were two vacancies in the Sacramento office. And so it was made at a time when you could advertise and tell whoever you hired, you may be working in Reno or Las Vegas or wherever. So it was not to yank somebody and uproot them from their Sacramento home. And it was made at that time, and quite frankly, it was ignored because they were both filled with the request pending to the secretary. The question I really wanna know is, because I know there was somebody from, from the solicitor's office in DC that sat in on those, I'd like to know if the guy who signed that letter to me telling me that he would consider my suggestion was the guy who sat in on the personnel session to interview people to fill a position in Sacramento that we had done, by the way, what Mr. Tanner had asked us to do, send a letter to the secretary. So, oversight thing. Um, thank you very much for the fact that, I don't always like the answers, but I appreciate the fact that you get back to me as fast as you can. Sometimes, you know, I get a little whatever. But I want to let you know, in, in the idea of full disclosure, it's like I've submitted some things to basically say from last year's budget where firefighting, and we talked with the undersecretary about this, where, where firefighting preparedness was cut $10 million and the $10 million was put into facilities. It's, it, it, it's, it's my judgment, unless somebody can say, here's where you screwed it up. We don't want to add new money, change your money. We want to take it back out of facilities and put it into preparedness. So that's not a surprise if you've got some thoughts about that. 
Um, the final thing I, I want to let you know is, is we've had a recent thing come up. It's time, th th there's a draft EIS coming out of the Winnemucca, Nevada office on Burning Man. Um, the biggest uh, public event that BLM does in the nation. Um, and so, you know, the last couple of years has kind of been, we're going to kind of do what we did before, but this is the first real look. It came out the 15th with, with a, with a uh, deadline for comments for the end of this month. Um, we are going to submit a request to those folks to say, hey, can you give them 30 more days since it's fairly significant draft EIS, changes a lot of things. So I mentioned that in the meeting to just in the, in the interest of saying, hey, um, we've disclosed this. It's, it's not, I'm going to deliver it to Mr. Raby tomorrow when I'm in Reno. Um, and the Winnemucca people are getting notified by phone today. But, but the idea is pretty big change in, in terms of trying to update the way that, that they evaluate that. And so, quite frankly, we think another 30 days for something like that is not exactly a big deal. So, um, with that, I think uh, the rest is you know the rest. There's more over um, there's more oversight stuff going on, but but we'll continue to use that through the regular uh, channels. And if you have to come back again and have some more fun, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you. I have a update on what's going on, on the floor. They actually went into recess. Um, usually when you go into recess, it's a minimum of 15 minutes. When they come back from recess, we anticipate that they'll go back into voting with several amendments and possibly two motions to recommit. So uh, Mr. Dreisen and our sales staffs have conferred, and so when we go into um, voting, we might take one more question and then we'll adjourn the, the committee. We're not going to make you sit here and watch paint dry <laughs> as we're, we're down there uh, voting on the, on the House floor. So thank you very much and thank you for your indulgence while we figure that out for you gentlemen. Um, I'm going to give it a try. Mr. An Angeli? Angel. Angel. I'm going to, I want to, I didn't take French. I took Latin. Doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> for several now, uh, years now, the Interior Appropriations Bill has contained language authorizing the agency to charge inspections fees. Uh, to the companies who operate the drilling rigs on the Outer Continental Shelf. And um, I see these simple, simply as user fees, which are charged throughout the government. Um, fiscal uh, 2012, the current fee structure was put in place, and your agency collected um, uh, $62 million. All of that was used to offset the cost of the inspection fees. In your 2020 budget, which is based on the same fee structure, the collections are estimated to be $43 million. Now that's a one-third loss of revenue, which this subcommittee is going to have to make up somewhere. So given the demands on our resources uh, and all that you're expected to do, um, and you've talked about how your research funding is already being, being cut, I find that very disheartening. So here, here are my two questions. First, what percentage of the program cost do these fees actually cover? And secondly, is there any reason why the fees haven't been raised over the past eight years, at least at a minimum indexed to inflation to protect, to protect the taxpayer? So thank you for that question. Uh, uh, certainly when we take a look at inspections, it again, not only applies to uh, the drilling operations, but it also applies to the production operations. So we have about 2,100 facilities on the Outer Continental Shelf that we have to inspect at least once a year, and we inspect drilling operations once every 30 days. Uh, as uh, as goes the 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 we we have been in a contracting period of time for uh, some some perhaps maybe a decade or so, where the number of inspectable facilities have shrunk, uh, meaning the number of production platforms have shrunk. Uh, as the economy, uh, as the economics of the market have changed, and as the life cycle of the, uh, the province has, has changed. Uh, approximately two-thirds of our inspection uh, revenue, uh, uh, two-thirds of our costs can be offset by, by the revenue to the degree that it hasn't been uh, increased over time. I, it's my understanding that that's a congressional uh, jurisdiction, uh, the, our fee structure is embedded into, in, into law. What we are proposing is that m in addition to that, many of the inspections over time have gone from the drilling rig operation, as we talked earlier, to the non-drilling rig. 
we have proposed in this budget cycle, as I understand previous administrations have as well, is the application of the opportunity to collect a fee for inspecting those operations that occur on a non-rig, which here to before occurred on a rig. That number has grown substantially, and that makes it a little bit more difficult for us to, uh, to, to keep up, if you would, with uh, the cost of the services. In, in that much of the activity is no longer uh, applicable for, for, for uh, the imposition of a fee. Nonetheless, we still have the responsibility to inspect it. We just can't uh, collect a fee associated with the use of a non-drilling rig. I have uh, pictures to the degree that the committee would like to see uh, the difference. Uh, here are pictures of a, a drilling rig, and here are non-rig images. I'm sorry, just to pass it over there. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so these are two separate sets. And these are two separate sets. So you'd, you'd have to, uh, Madam Chair, also uh, pass out the, the, the uh, slide deck to the right there. So, so again, uh, the legislation that set up the authority for us to impose a fee was specific to drilling rigs. And as more and more activities have occurred on non-drilling rigs, uh, there is no opportunity for the government to impose a fee. Uh, again, I have some numbers on that. Um, in fiscal year 2014, 82% of the well operations that we inspected used the rig, used the drilling rig. Four years later, only 53% of the well operations we inspected used the rig. So substantial move away, and of course the language just doesn't capture that activity. Therefore, it has to be inspected, but it can't. We can't. We cannot. Uh, we cannot impose a fee. Well, let's, let's, uh, <coughs> let's work together to update the language, uh, Mr. Joyce, with uh, um, Mr. Udall and um, and Senator Murkowski, and figure out how we get this back in balance so the oil companies are paying for their fair share as they had when they did on. Uh, the traditional, the old platform rig because the inspections still have to take place and it looks like you've got some ideas on how we can go forward and, and, and do that and if we have to talk to author authorizers, let's do that. But it sounds like the administration wants to do the right thing, protect the, to protect the taxpayers that the oil companies are paying for their own inspections. A Am I hearing you correctly? Absolutely. The administration supports the imposition of a fee for those same services that are conducted on a non-rig unit as conducted on a, a drilling rig unit. And, and there, there's good reason for that, is that the American people expect us, and so we should to inspect those services. There's costs associated with that. Uh, all of our uh, inspectors have to travel by helicopter to reach uh, the, the inspectable site. Uh, the most expensive thing we do is uh, put our uh, inspectors offshore on a helicopter. Uh, feel free to correct me if I am wrong, but it is dangerous work going on the drilling rigs. It's, it's dangerous work for all the employees, those even on, on the rigs themselves. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. You're in the middle of the ocean, things, to, but you are landing people on helicopters. It looks like there's a, not as much um, room to maneuver for uh, the employees doing the inspection on these non-rig units because they are so much smaller. Is, is it more expensive to do the uh, inspection fee? No, the, the, the cost to inspect on a non-rig unit is, for us, is no more expensive than, than, than a drilling rig. Much of it has to do with distance. Uh, often the times uh, the non-rig units are being used for decommissioning, end of life cycle work. Um, and, and of course that perhaps is uh, maybe a little bit closer onshore than some of the deep water uh, operations that we have. But the proposed non-rig fee would cover the cost of inspection. So that of which we, we have proposed would cover the cost of that inspection. Well, thank you. And as they say, you can learn something new every day. So, so uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Joyce, do you have a question? Oh, thank you, I do. And uh, this one will be for all three of you, if you would. Your three, as you're all aware, uh, your oil and gas programs remain on the Government Accountability Office's high-risk list. As you may know, once on the list, you have to earn your way off of it. 
Although it might not be seen like it to staff, the benefits of not uh, of being on the list are twofold. First, it gives Congress targets to shoot for, for helping us focus on problems we can solve. Second, it gets the attention of the agency leadership, uh, since its uh, demonstrated commitment by agency leadership is one of the prerequisites for getting off the list. According to the GAO, this high-risk area has three segments, loyalty determination and collection, human capital challenges, and restructuring of offshore oil and gas oversight. As of December 2018, Interior had partially met all the criteria for fixing these segments and getting off the list. That's the good news. You and your staff deserve a sincere thank you for your hard work on this. Please take a moment to refresh the subcommittee on the GAO's main concerns in the three areas of royalty determination collection, human capital challenges, and restructuring of offshore oil and gas oversight. Please explain to the subcommittee the next steps you plan to take in these areas and how the FY20 budget proposal helps you get there. And uh, lastly, is it realistic to expect that you'll have the uh, given GAO every reason to remove your oil and gas programs from the high risk list by the time the list is updated two years from now? Take your pick, who you want to <laughs> fight. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try. Thank you for that question, sir. Uh, so uh, again, you know, being on a high risk uh, list uh, does have its uh, challenges. Uh, and certainly when we take a look at what we do at VESI uh, as a uh, agency that provides safety and environmental enforcement oversight, uh, keeping in mind that 18 percent of the oil that is produced in America comes from offshore, 99 percent of that of which comes offshore comes from the Gulf of Mexico, and 85 percent of that about comes from deep water. So again, more complex, more challenging, and uh, again, uh, uh, out of sight, out of mind uh, kind of uh, 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 activity. So a couple of things that, that we have done. We have worked, uh, as you may be aware, the Office of Natural Resource Revenue is responsible for the billing of the royalties. We are uh, we actually perform some of the meter reading uh, when we, through our inspectors that we fly offshore. We, we have a, a contract uh, with uh, the Office, uh, Office of Natural Resource Revenue uh, that helps to pay for some of the costs associated with that. We believe that separation uh, provides a, a service that we don't commingle, if you would. Our safety and inspection part, uh, it's, dedicated, it's a dedicated group of in, uh, meter inspectors. We believe that goes a long way in helping to make sure that the, the meters are inspected or calibrated uh, to make certain that the royalties are, are a function of, of accurate meeting, read of meetings. When we continue beyond that, you know, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is we talked earlier the, the risk-based inspections. We also talked about trying to get to a point where we can, we can certify our inspectors. Uh, I believe the time has come in America and we will be uh, approaching this year with an effort to certify our inspectors, that our inspectors meet a competency, not that based, is just based on on-the-job training or previous experience, but a test of competencies that express to the entire world that the, the inspectors that we have working for the government meet those minimum standards. We believe when we add risk-based inspections, we add some of the things that we are doing with regards to environmental enforcement. All those things move us towards uh, a less of a high-risk agency as we are participating in the, in the management of the offshore resources. I'm happy to get for you a list of all the things that we have done. They are robust, uh, too numerous to mention here in terms of safety, in terms of environmental uh, stewardship that I think will impress you of what we've been in the last uh, 18 months, 24 months. had his time in the fire. Yeah, <laughs> uh, thank you to respond to the question for you. <laughs> um, I, I will address a couple of things. I think uh, Director Angel addressed the royalty uh, issue, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about the other two. The issue about uh, really reorganization of, of, of uh, offshore oversight was grounded in GAO's concern that as what was the Minerals Management Service was devolved into existing bureaus that it would uh, distract us from being able to focus on, on the mission that we needed to focus on. I, I think those concerns have been addressed, um, that we were able to successfully carry out uh, the, the division of MMS into to Balm and Bessie and uh, Office of Natural Resources Revenue. And um, really what we focused on there now is making sure that, that we maintain communication and a close working relationship with our, our uh, sibling bureaus uh, to make sure that the fact that we now split doesn't cause any unintended consequences. And, and I can assure you, Director Angel and I have a very close working relationship, as do our staffs, and uh, we are constantly working with each other to address any issues that may come up. I think the biggest challenge remaining for us from the high risk list uh, for, for BOEM uh, is the human capital challenge for a lot of, of 
key types of positions, particularly geologists and petroleum engineers, uh, we are competing with industry uh, for, for that expertise. And uh, they, at least when prices haven't bottomed out entirely, they are able to, to pay quite a bit more than we are. Um, so we have been able to, to take several steps um, with, with the uh, committee's help. We, we do have a special salary rate in place for, uh, for geoscientists and uh, petroleum engineers, with, with, which helps but doesn't entirely close the gap. And uh, we do a lot of active recruiting and training. Uh, but um, if, if industry really wants to hire somebody away from us, they'll, they'll be able to find a way to do it. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what level we have to meet for GAO to feel like we've, we've done everything we can. But we are continuing to, to look at all the uh, tools that we have in the toolbox to both uh, recruit and, ret and, and uh, retain uh, qualified people. I know for my time as prosecutor, just about the time somebody really gets it, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's tough to compete with the uh, private sector in that respect. Dr. Steed, you had a lot of time here today, so. Uh, Gosh, I feel lucky. And I have to say it's unfair to have to answer the same question that Mr. Angel answered. <laughs> his, his accent is by far more interesting than mine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll just touch briefly on the human capital challenges as well. Uh, it's, it's always a challenge to retain. Uh, uh, good employees when, w not to say the BLM employees are not good, we have great employees, but there's always that competition with, with the private sector and, uh, and our reimbursement rates, uh, surprisingly, are not often the same. Uh, that being said, I can say that the President's budget has requested a robust uh, inspection and enforcement and component, uh, and uh, we'll have to talk more about that as, as needed. <coughs> Certainly, I'd like you to address, uh, as you've noticed, I, I've let my other uh, teammates, if you will, here on the committee take their shots first because uh, in, in one thing I've heard when I had the pleasure of uh, going out and to visit uh, Mr. Amadeus district was uh, the concerns with making sure they had the proper personnel in place and the decisions being made on a timely basis so they can continue to move forward. So I think that's an important part of the process. Not having the people in place doesn't necessarily help you either. Uh, I yield back. So this is for you, uh, Dr. Uh, Cruikshank. On page 10 of your budget justification, the Bureau uh, says that BOMA strives to streamline and refine its permitting NEPA process, and the NEPA process is the National Environmental Review uh, Policy Act. And, and then on page 24 of the budget says the Bureau is seeking out regulatory and oversight efficiencies. So can you tell the committee what those terms mean to this administration because they're they, they, they sound nice, but the devil will be in the detail. Uh, and if you have um, something you want to say now, if you want to get back to us about what pro uh, aspects of the NEPA process are you going to be refining and uh, creating efficiencies in? I'd be happy to respond. Um, I, I don't know the order numbers off the top of my head, but there is an executive order dealing with uh, review of major infrastructure projects calling for one federal decision. So it's, it's working with the other agencies uh, where, where we are a lead um, to make sure that the NEPA work we do will, will meet the information needs of every agency that needs to issue a permit and try and, and, and work together to make sure we, we have an NEPA document that serves that purpose. Uh, that that uh, executive order also calls for, for a single record of decision that, that all of the agencies can sign on to. So uh, a lot of what we're doing under that particular executive order is making sure that all the agencies that, that, that have a role to play in, in a review of a project are all on the same page about how to proceed and, and can leverage their resources to work together. Uh, to, to get to a single decision as opposed to having uh, folks working in parallel or sequentially to make several different decisions for the same project. So that, that's, uh, that's a large part of it. Uh, there's also a secretary's order uh, that is specific to how we, we do uh, NEPA reviews within the department in terms of setting phase limits and timelines uh, for environmental impact statements. And um, so we are all in a learning process of, of seeing how we can uh, best meet all these new requirements from the two orders. And, and uh, I think we're in a good place. Uh, the, 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 the goal of, of the second order was really to focus on what are significant impacts, uh, not to, to write an encyclopedia of everything you know about a subject, but really to tell the decision maker, this is what you need to know to inform 
uh, your decision and uh, uh, to, to make those documents more accessible and more readable to decision makers so that they actually do have an impact on decisions. And um, so th those are the sorts of things that we are talking about. Well, here. I'll, I'll be interested to see uh, if you can uh, keep us apprised in the other agencies as well, too. You know, those are public documents, so those just aren't for the decision makers. They're for the public to be able to read and understand what its government is, is doing and how, and how the decision is being formulated. So um, I, I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the wanting to get to brevity and, um, and you know, everybody working together and being on the same page. All that's fine, but at the same time, it has to have um, it needs to be readable for future generations so that they know how we came to that decision because they'll be the ones impacted by the decisions made today. So I look if forward to learning if more. If about I can that. address that, I, th I think that's that's very true. And and a lot of what you know, a lot of these past environmental impact statements were really thick and dry scientific tomes where uh, a lot of the public would would, would probably fall asleep <laughs> when they got very far into several thousand page documents. A lot of what we're doing now is trying to. Uh, Simplify language uh, using a lot of visuals and graphics to to to, to make the information more accessible to a general reader uh, to to help inform really what's what 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 the important information is uh, during the review. That's true, and I'm not a scientist, but the science is how the decision came to be and whose science was used yes. when making the decision. And, and so that is all, all the scientific studies are referenced and available on the web. So if someone wants to dig deeper, they can. Well, we'll we'll take a we'll take a look. Um, I have a question on on the waivers that the Bureau of Safety uh, and Enforcement have been um, doing, and um, you've been granting waivers to oil uh, uh, companies, and many of us believe it's to circumvent the wellhead restrictions implemented after the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. And according to your reports, your agency has approved 1,679 waivers between August 2016 and the current, uh, when the current rule went into effect of March of last year. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, no one really knows how many more waivers Bessie has granted over the past year. Maybe, maybe you know that. Um, it's been murky for us to try to figure out at best. So I have a series of questions and you can certainly get back to us in writing. And gentlemen, um, the majority and the minority both have might have some more questions that we'll be submitting in, in writing. Uh, so here, just on these waivers, so you get a flavor of what um, we're looking for. How many waivers have been granted since the rule went into effect? Zero. Are there written criteria for evaluating a request and determining whether the waiver was granted? There is no such thing as a waiver. If you are referencing the political article about the 1,700 waivers, that was that was misinformation. We have provided information to uh, members of the committee okay, here. Well, I have questions. So the question was: Is there written criteria for evaluating a request? There is a written criteria for to evaluate the request for alternate compliance, and that that criteria is it has to be as safe or safer. Uh, the reason I, I, I jumped in, Madam Chair, is no, that there's fine. a difference I'm, I'm between. I'm just trying to get through before right. I have to go vote. That's that's the reason yeah. why I'm There's a I'm there's open. a difference between a waiver and an alternate compliance. Alternate compliance has been around since 1988, when the original well control rule was promulgated by the previous administration. Former Director Salerno testified to the committees that it would be using alternate compliance as a way to usher in the new rule. So waiver is something different than alternate compliance. Alternate compliance is what was used. And alternate compliance was used more by the previous administration than has been used by this administration. And that and that that's that's why we have these, you know, um, opportunities for us to uh, interact with each other. So um, so there's alternate compliance and there's waivers and so we'll make sure that we structure the question in a way that that uh, addresses both those issues. So I appreciate you sure. jumping in sure. and, and, and sharing. Uh, Mr. Joyce, anything else? Well, Dr. Siegel was saying about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but no, I have no further questions. I will submit some for the record, okay. though. Thank you all for being here today. And spending I want to thank there. you gentlemen and the people behind you who made today possible, uh, all the federal employees that work uh, with you for the work that, that they do. It's, it's, it's valued. Um, they do important work. Um, we haven't gone into this level of detail for um, hearings and oversight for a while. 
I look forward to this exchange. It was very helpful for me, Mr. Joyce, the committee members, as we work together to put together a budget uh, and an appropriations bill that will serve the American people and protect our environment and our national resources. Thank you very much. With that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>